So now is there we go. Now we see Jennifer's um, first screen. Thank you, and take it away, Jennifer. All right. Well, hello everyone. Uh, thank you for the invitation to speak today. My internet's a bit unstable. It's storming here, so I'm leaving my video off to hopefully improve the connection. So I'm going to talk briefly about an ongoing collaborative project focused on this exceedingly handsome bird, uh, the white-breasted thrasher. So the thrasher is a medium-sized non-migratory songbird in the Mimid family. The West Indian thrashers and trumblers comprise five species, so two trumblers, a pearly-eyed thrasher, a scaly-breasted thrasher, and of course the white-breasted thrasher, found on 29 islands. This group is considered one of the archipelago's few avian radiations and is an important component of the area's avian diversity. So the thrasher, the white-breasted, the species that we'll focus on from here on out, is restricted to two small islands in the Western Antilles, Martinique and St. Lucia, where it has subspecies status on each island. Within this two island range, it's restricted to three main areas, one in Martinique and two on the east coast of St. Lucia. In the early 20th century, the Caribbean ornithologist and international super spy namesake, James Bond, described the species as one of the rarest birds in the West Indies. And it's still rare today. So the species is categorized as endangered with an extant population size of about 300 in Martinique, about 150 in the north of St. Lucia, and about 1400 in Mandalay, the stronghold. Historic declines on both islands are thought to be due mainly to conversion of habitat for agriculture. So habitat loss is a problem for the species in particular because thrashers are dry forest specialists. This photo is of a typical dry forest in St. Lucia, which has a thick layer of leaf litter through which the thrasher forages to invertebrates by lifting up leaves and throwing them to the side. And they spend a lot, a lot of time foraging on the ground. This type of forest occurs near the coast, is relatively flat, so it is attractive for other uses, such as agriculture and touristic development. And speaking of, the stronghold of the species distribution was recently reduced by significant habitat loss. So this is the Mandalay Range in a white outline before loss. It's not big. In 2006, a large portion of this area was sold to developers, which is the Yellow Polygon, build the first mega resort on the east coast of St. Lucia. To date, about 20% of the species habitat within this range has been destroyed with additional areas degraded. So after land for the golf course was cleared, the economy crashed and the bank funding the project went under. So this is an on the ground image shortly after habitat loss. And if you just turn around, looking in the other direction towards the sea, you can see there's been little regrowth in the past 14 years. So switching gears a little, the thrasher is fairly well studied for a tropical bird. I already mentioned some of the work on its distribution, population size, and habitat requirements. We use some of these field data to build a habitat suitability model for the species in St. Lucia, which is shown here. And what this model suggests is that the species currently occurs in much of the suitable habitat across the island, with a small patch to the south of the Mandalay Range possibly meriting investigation. In field studies, we've generated an extensive data set on reproduction, annual survival, social behavior, and St. Lucia that spans decades. And then we use this database to parameterize population viability models. And most recently, there's been phylogenetic and population genomics work where we've generated novel genetic data that suggests species level differences between the island bases of this bird. All right, so there's all this research and it's recently motivated the development of a conservation plan for the species. This plan is specific to the St. Lucia subspecies and is called the Gauge Bland Plan after the species Korean name. It was created with outputs from a multi-day participatory workshop and the objectives are aligned with the main deterministic factors affecting the species. So habitat loss, habitat degradation, and important for the talk today, depredation by non-native animals. So we recently received funding to tackle several of the management actions identified in the plan. And our ongoing project has three objectives or outcomes. And very briefly, outcome one is a participatory habitat management plan. Um, 
Outcome two is changing of hearts and minds. And outcome three is an invasive predator reduction program with the goal of increasing fracture nesting success, which will be the focus of the rest of the talk, as projects within the other two objectives have been put on hold for now due to COVID. So the first step for this outcome three was to deploy a camera track network to collect baseline info on non-native predator abundance and activity patterns and to guide selection for the predator intervention. So we deployed this network across four sites within the Mandalay Range, again, this white polygon, as all areas are known to have thrashers for three months. So two sites were within habitat fragments on the abandoned development property here in the south, and two others were in more or less contiguous forests in other parts of the range. Cameras were positioned, um, the positions were chosen randomly using a predetermined grid, and they were 100 meters apart resulting in seven cameras per site, which are shown as the black dots on this map. So cameras were installed about 25 centimeters from the ground based on the size of our target species, and we cleared veg in front of them to allow better detection of passing animals. And they were checked every two weeks by the St. Lucia Forestry Department and the National Trust. So, our 28 cameras took over 16,000 photos across our almost 2,500 trap days. Um, and we scored them for presence, absence, and species level identification of any animal that occurred within the frame. We then filtered out false positives, so mostly moving vegetation, and triggers by our field team, which left almost 11,000 photos remaining in our sample. Our next step was then to use a 30 minute threshold to define independent detections. So that means that we excluded photos where the same species was photographed more than twice within 30 minutes at the same cam camera trap. And this is a very common method when analyzing these sorts of data. All right, so we use these remaining 1,670 photos to estimate a relative abundance index of species across sites. And so this is the standardized for slightly different sampling effort across camera traps. But because trapping rates, even when corrected by a detection threshold, are affected by animal activity patterns, so for example, active animals will result in more camera triggers in size, so larger animals are more likely to be detected, comparisons should be made within species across sites rather than between species when you're looking at these data. So I'm going to guide you through the table for the rest of the talk and point out a few interesting things that we found. So the table is oriented so that we have species on the left and then two columns for each of the four sites. So site one, two, three, and four. And the column on the left for each site are these relative detections. And then the next column is the absolute number of traps. So seven cameras are possible at each site that each species was detected at. So we encountered 26 species total and we'll focus on mammals and birds. So here are our target mammals. They're highlighted in gray and include mongoose, possum, cats, and rats. So the rodent category are images for which I need a second opinion still. So for example, if we focus on rats, indices of rat abundance were rather similar across all sites and detected at about half of the cameras per site. On the right, we see a photo of two rats that were captured in the early hours of the morning. Mongoose were the least detected of our target mammals, though they were still detected across each of the four sites. This result is unsurprising given the species typical movement patterns in our relatively small study areas, and they were mostly seen during the day. So in contrast to mongoose though, possum had the highest number of detections. They were often seen climbing trees, carrying leaf litter in their curled tails. You can even tell that this one's a male they were found at nearly every camera trap station. The relative abundance was higher at sites S3 and S4, which are up here. And these two sites occur within larger patches of forest and are also closer to developed areas, for example, gardens, small scale ag, including marijuana plantations, which is also a reason why these sites, likely a reason why these sites had more feral pigs, dogs and cows as well. All right, so now on to birds. Of the 13 species we encountered, two were St. Lucian endemics, five were lesser Antillian endemics, and four were Caribbean endemics. So Thrasher, our target bird, 
seen peering here into the camera on the bottom left was detected frequently and found at nearly every single trim camera trap location. So 26 of 28 traps it was detected, which was a relief to see. Surprisingly, we even recited two thrashers that I'd color banded as adults seven years ago. In this photo, you can pretty clearly see the red over orange on this bird's right leg. We often saw um, moderately sized groups of thrashers foraging together, which is interesting. The species is a cooperative breeder, but little is known about group dynamics during the non-breeding season. And so here we have at least seven birds foraging together. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Another species of conservation concern or interest encountered was the black finch shown here on the bottom left. This is an endangered bird endemic to St. Lucia, and hearteningly, it was found across all four of the sites. It's not a species of conservation concern, but one that was highly detected and highly entertaining when scoring the photos, especially during their hours long courting displays, which part of is shown here was the Zenata dove. And finally, the forest thrush, which has an endemic subspecies in St. Lucia, was detected at four camera trap locations across two sites. This is pretty amazing because despite extensive searches for the species during birding and research expeditions over the past few decades, there have been very few confirmed sightings since the 1980s. And so the species is clearly, clearly not, bleh, the species is clearly not been extirpated as some people have feared. All right, so what's next? So all of these data, including the mammal activity patterns that I didn't talk about, um, were used to write an invasive predator reduction plan that is currently being reviewed by experts. So this will be implemented at two sites, S1 and S3, using baiting stations targeting rats and live traps targeting mongoose, cats, and possum. Also ongoing, the camera traps are currently being deployed at active nests across the four sites. And the purpose here is to monitor the relative impact of native, native versus non-native predators and collect additional data on pre-intervention thrasher nesting success. And this monitoring will, will really be essential to evaluate the success of the intervention. So to wrap up, beyond adaptive management and conservation of this single species, this project may be an important example for the islands and maybe even the region so St. Lucia, as is the case in many other islands, has an impressive track record of protecting their upper elevation wet forests and associated species. So in the case of St. Lucia, actually, this process initiated the first rare pride campaign leading to recovery of St. Lucia parrot. However, lower elevation dry forests used more by people are often seen as unimportant habitat. So we hope that through this work, we can change this misconception. With that, thank you to the Betty Peterson Conservation Fund for supporting this work, and thank you all for tuning in.